A very, very warm good afternoon to all the already energized dear Toastmasters and hereby I declare Division TLI training number 10 open. So today, while we were designing the calendar, we were putting trainings which were relevant at a club level. And because we wanted more club participation and also the idea was we will record these trainings for posterity, post them on YouTube, so anyone can when they type in this particular training that they want, this our training, TLI training, Division G TLI training will pop up and we are hoping it will help. So how is it that we arrived at parliamentary procedures? When we were designing the calendar almost a year back, Mangai Ma'am and I would be in constant discussion on what phase the club is in at what stage. For instance, we had done some uh, contest-based trainings before the contest and this is the time when most clubs are electing their leaders and also new leaders are coming in. So we thought the situation is primed for a topic like parliamentary procedures. Now that was the calendar. Then we come to the trainer. When we talked about procedure, especially how to conduct yourself, quite a number of names popped up, but one name stood out. Yes, you guessed it right. It is our Toastmaster trainer this afternoon, Distinguished Toastmaster Ravi Kumar sir's name. I have known a Distinguished Toastmaster Ravi Kumar since 2019, perhaps the start, the beginning of 2000, end of 2018, 19. And every time I have interacted with him it's been fun you you did hear some of our leaders talk about his stories he is i don't know how many of you remember this but when we were young you know in the 90s uh, there was this story on doordarshan which is the indian channel about potli baba <laughs> the person who had all the stories tied up in his potli so the distinguished toastmaster ravi kumar is someone like that for me him and another person anthony uh, toastmaster anthony someday we will uh, talk talk to him also so both of these are those stories potli potli is a bag in hindi potli baba so please put your hands together to someone whom i admire and i'm sure all of us do admire at some level distinguished toastmaster ravi kumar sir as he takes us to parliamentary procedures training today over to you sir Thank you, Toastmaster Nalini. Wow, you really made me a portly club. And now I'm thinking how to get back the stories. Because, you know, in parliamentary procedure, I thought I'll just start playing. But now, since you all of you have get out me, so I think I have to tell some story, right? Uh, thank you, first of all, for giving me this opportunity. And in fact, you know, when you told me that uh, you'll be the trainer for the parliamentary procedures, uh, I was a bit... Uh, you know, sort of uh, in an ambiguous mind whether, you know, but then when I started reading, of course, I've, been, I've attended a couple of uh, district uh, uh, committee, uh, uh, district meetings where, you know, this was employed to a large extent. Uh, but when I started uh, going into, uh, into the details, I found that it is complementing to where I work because I work for procurement and contracts. And we are geared by all the policies and procedures and bylaws and protocols and stuff. So it kind of complemented, uh, you know, the parliamentary procedures that we use in Toastmasters. So uh, I would like to start with a recent incident. So in spite of having all the policies and procedures in place, uh, last year we had an incident in our company where, you know, um, uh, so we have this basement five, uh, which is... Uh, which is maybe around 50 meters down the ground level. So there was some uh, malfunction in the dewatering pump and water started seeping in. So now we have our policy and procedure very strict that if there is any maintenance work or if there is any project work or there is any uh, capital expenditure work uh, that is beyond 1 million or whatever the cap. So if in such cases, you have, there are certain protocols that we follow, we get into the committee, we address the committee, we justify the project, we, we set up the profitability margins or whatever the, the cost centers, and then the decision is taken. But when an emergency situation arises, all the possible rules were flouted, right? Because the, 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 it was really unprecedented and uh, whatever needs to be done had to be done and therefore, so the point I'm making is, of course, we have all the policies and procedures and protocols and bylaws and uh, district administrative bylaws. What needs to be done, needs to be done. But 
the difference between a parliamentary procedure and the other protocols is in a parliamentary procedure uh, it is a event that is futuristic in the sense that if it is approved from the committee uh, after certain norms and procedures it is a futuristic event so if it goes through it goes through if it doesn't it doesn't so there is a difference between uh, the company uh, policy procedures and the parliamentary procedures so let me share my screen is the screen visible yes sir we can see it here but we are able to see the next slide also so maybe you want to tell it, it should be actually a presentation mode then it will be visible completely what is it uh, this one if you can Hi. go to yeah no no not present how is it now yes it's fine now it's okay now you can see only the first screen right yes sir yeah so before i start uh, let me just ask you a question that how many of you i can i know a couple of them uh, because i know them personally they've been there in the district to council meetings but um, how many of you have uh, known what is a parliamentary procedure and seen how it is executed okay quite a few of them so when does a uh, during the area contests during the division contest where is the parliamentary procedure implemented can i have some answers uh, i don't where know yeah let me rephrase my question where have you seen if at all you have seen a parliamentary procedure being followed whether have you seen it in a club meeting sometime have you seen it in some contest have you seen it elsewhere where during, have you seen in toastmasters during club elections i do normally see parliamentary procedures in action a uh, contest I, i don't know unless someone else has but yes during elections i remember that they follow parliamentary procedures a lot in club normally in clubs it comes in the uh, business session if at all some motion has been passed preferred by the members perfect perfect so basically a parliamentary procedure is implemented during the club business meeting which we also called as excom meeting in area excom meeting division excom meeting district council meeting so these are the places where the parliamentary procedures are uh, seen and implemented for the simple reason that there are certain decisions that needs to be amended a certain uh, a certain motion has to be put in certain uh, alignment has to be done club alignment has to be done there is a treasurer report there are so many reports that needs to be approved and uh, in certain cases some uh, some uh, some modifications needs to be done uh, uh, with respect to venue with respect to time with respect to the minutes of meeting so on and so forth so you will see parliamentary procedures in business meetings especially and uh, the parliamentary procedure is implemented because imagine if there is no parliamentary procedure you will have a chaos you will you will not you will end up dissatisfying somebody because i don't want to read uh, from this slide but in my experience without a parliamentary procedure uh, when a decision is taken you will end up dissatisfying many uh, there can be chaos there can be ruckus uh you will uh, you will have some people uh, very happy uh, at the same time it will sow seeds of hatred and it can go further escalating that can create more and more troubles so parliamentary procedure is used to to to, to take a consensus on the decision in a amicable manner where you agree to disagree and finally we have a solution which is majority approved so there is no argument or there is no 
hard feeling to it. But why this parliament? Before we go into parliamentary, let me give you an overview of how, from where this is stemming up. See, in in the uh, global platform, whether it is a country, whether it is a corporation or a company, whether it is an institution, whether it is a NGO, a NPO, uh, whether it is a private limited company, uh, or or it is a or is it an associated organization of some embassies? So every organization, there are certain laws and certain norms that has to be uh, met with. For example, in the country level, we have a state and a federal law. We have the governing corporations. Uh, we have public legislative bodies uh, who write these federal and state laws. There are parliament uh, functionaries. There are parliament uh, methodologies, how the parliament should function, so on and so forth on the country level. In case of, uh, organ in case of companies, a business, uh, in case of business organizations, we have the Articles of Association, we have the Memorandum of Association. Those are the governing documents based on which the company runs. As far as um, our organization is concerned, like Toastmasters, which is a non-profitable uh, educational organization, we have governing documents. So these governing documents decides on how the organization operates uh, with respect to, uh, with respect to its chapters, to its affiliates, uh, having local constitutions and bylaws. You have the district administrative bylaws, you have the club constitution, uh, you have a structure on how things operate, and there are fundamental rules. And there are also standing rules. So uh, these are the documents that is uh, relevant to all these organizations. So we fall under a, a non-profitable uh, organization, therefore, our governing documents are uh, all that I listed before, which is the uh, constitu club constitution bylaws, the district administrative bylaws, uh, the policies and protocol, uh, the executive order, so on and so forth. So today we will just uh, quickly go through this parliamentary procedure. We will appreciate uh, the principles of the par parliamentary procedure. Uh, we will prepare the order of business. I'll explain to you what the order of business means. You recognize the various types of motion. I'll explain what, what you mean by a motion, how to make and amend a motion, and finally, how to second a motion. So as I said, why do we use a parliamentary procedure? So parliamentary procedure, it gives each and every member. See, first of all, uh, in the parliament, in the parliament, wherever you implement during your meetings, the parliamentary procedure uh, that has to be implemented shall be done by the members only. So no members have, have the authority to uh, either pass a motion, amend a motion, or for that matter, preside over a meeting or be a part of the meeting. I remember in 2016, uh, when I was 2015, when I went to Dubai for our district conference. So before the uh, this district uh, expom began, so they clearly asked everybody that whoever is not a part of the district council has to leave the auditorium. So you know, just to make sure, so you have to have a member and plus the decorum of that particular meeting of who are supposed to attend that meeting. So it's a very clear, uh, the, the rules are very clear set that who will be a part of the meeting and who takes and who makes a decision. Of course, it promotes cooperation and harmony, as I told you. It prevents confusion when, dis discussing, uh, when discussing the group business. And it ensures that it is a productive meeting and facilitate the transaction. Of course, these are the standard uh, sentences that uh, are put. But as far as I'm concerned, with my experience, I can vouch that because of this parliamentary procedure, we end up amicably. So there is no ambiguity on the decision taken. Uh, we agree to disagree and there is harmony and peace. So this is, these are the key points of having a parliamentary procedure. What are the five basic principles of a parliamentary procedure? See, all members in the meeting have equal rights, equal privileges and obligations. So we have to treat all the members with justice and courtesy. 
a quorum must be present for the group to act i'll come to this point later in a, in a future slide and if the bylaws of the organization do not establish the quorum the general rule is that the majority of the membership must be present what is a quorum quorum is the minimum number of members that should be available at that point in time in the meeting to take to make or take a decision uh, in toastmasters uh, we have a two thirds majority uh, that has to be recorded before we start the meeting when when the order is called and we take a roll call and the quorum has to be two thirds before we before you start in, get into the meeting discuss one topic at a time so only one question at a time is considered and only one person has the floor at any time having the floor means he has the permission by the presiding officer to speak on his motion or to speak on uh, the whoever if it if he is seconding he 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 has the floor to speak at that time no other speaker can speak until he is recognized by the chair okay allow full and free discussion of each idea presented carry out uh, the will of the majority and respect the right of the minority of course this uh, we will come back to the later slides how we will get into the debate and how the debate is conducted and finally how the presiding officer uh, will uh, uh, will will take a, a yes and no from the members and finally on the basis of majority he will pass the decision uh, one point i need to make here is personal remarks are considered out of order so uh, the remarks that the members put in should always be related to the to the club or to the organization per se uh, individual remarks are not considered and it is uh, it is not it is it, it's considered out of order in terms of technicality the majority decides uh, a question except when the basic rights of the members are involved also one more important point here is silence gives consent so those who have not voted they allow the decision to be made by those who do vote so as they say uh, i recall a saying that the bad politicians are elected by the good people who do not vote right this used to be my slogan uh, <laughs> when i was in the college so a bad politician is voted by good people who do not vote so therefore uh, silence uh, is 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 not uh, recommendable so either you have to take a decision for uh, for the yes or for the no so that uh, gets into your participation as a healthy debate and the and the quorum uh, so the decision is uh, like like you have in the speech contest the number of judges the more precise is the decision similarly the more number of votes uh, gives a, a consensus to the organization to take a decision that is justified so there is a gavel etiquette during the meeting uh, for three taps all the members stand for two taps it's the call to order for one tap it's usually used for adjourning the meeting which is the completion of a business item and uh, the members to be seated and a series of tap restores the order so what is the order of business the order of business is nothing but a predetermined sequence of matters that are dealt by the assembly so in our case in those masters order of business is nothing but the agenda so what does the agenda do the agenda defines the sequence of event whose role is what and who is going to speak on what uh, and uh, and when does the meeting start and when does the meeting end so for us the order of business is the agenda and usually it begins with the call to order can someone tell me what is what do you mean by call to order is it like the opening of the meeting yeah so but for the opening of the meeting we can say uh, i i open the meeting so what is the difference between opening a meeting and call to order 
I think call to order is then for 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 the motion or the topic of discussion. I don't know. Am I right? I. Okay. Good try. Good try. Uh, Philip, maybe Philip can put some light on this. I'm very poor on parliamentary. I think call to order is uh, starting the, uh, the 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 particular meeting. That's what I thought. Yeah. See, till yesterday I was also thinking the same thing. Okay. But today <laughs> the definition changed. See, okay. actually, call to order means uh, the order of the business will be followed in that meeting. Oh, okay, okay. So when you say call to order, which means the order of the business uh, that has the itinerary will be followed. Okay. And nothing else uh, apart from that will be uh, will be discussed or will be inducted into the meeting. So that is the precise meaning of meaning, meaning of call to order. Uh, I and think that's who calls the, Yeah. And who calls the order? It is the presiding officer. Correct. So presiding officer means, uh, for example. If it's a club business meeting, the presiding officer is a club president. If it is an area governing council meeting, the presiding officer would be the area director. So on and so forth. So division also the same. So when it comes to the district uh, excom and district council meeting, the presiding officer is the district director. But what happens in a large meeting? The presiding officer usually is accompanied by a parliamentarian. Why we have a parliamentarian is. The parliamentarian has uh, does not have the authority to uh, to change or make the decision. He is only there to interpret the constitution or interpret the bylaw or interpret the protocol to the house, just in case if there is a there is a fault line or just in case if there is a deviation. So it's only the presiding officer who has the authority to take the decision on the subject presented to the uh, meeting. And the parliamentarian is there only to assist him. But in case of the smaller meetings, like for example the club excom meeting, there is no need of a parliamentarian because it's a small, uh, uh, it's a small uh, meetings. Likewise, in area and division also, uh, it's up to the division director if he wants to have a parliamentarian besides him just to see that uh, things are in order or if somebody, you know, there's some deviation. So the presiding officer is the uh, person who has authority to take the decision. Or, uh, or negate a decision, whatever the uh, majority says. Ravi sir, so I a think. Typical Safir, order. Ravi sir, I think Safir Pardon sir has raised his hand. I think Safir sir has raised his hand. He wants to. Ravi, yeah, I actually, I am not able to see any one of you. Uh, ah, okay. uh, I am not able to say sorry, huh, because you can just sorry. go go start yeah. uh, speaking. Actually, Ravi, yeah. I have a question related to roll, uh, the call to order. Uh, yes. Normally, <coughs> in our club meetings, the sergeant at arms comes in first, mentions the meeting etiquettes, and then calls the presiding officer, who then calls the meeting to order. Correct? Yes. Now, somebody told me that as per the parliament procedures, the call to order needs to happen first, and then the uh, or if everything else should follow is that is that the correct understanding uh, see uh, the call to order is done by the presiding officer correct that that much is uh, i'm not uh, able to hear you is it a problem only for me or is it for others his uh, voice is I, I, I can hear i can hear okay let me just change my position maybe yeah maybe. You're, uh, you're audible now uh, now it's okay yeah yeah, yeah. All right. So, uh, see, basically what the uh, Robert's uh, rule book says is the call to order is usually done by the presiding officer. So whether the sergeant at arm comes uh, in, at in the beginning, uh, 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 but with the, the sequence that may vary, but it's only the presiding officer who can call to order because he's the one who's going to decide what happens in the meeting and the decision, not in terms of the club meeting, in terms of the business meeting that uh, that it, uh, that is conducted, mm -hmm. so the presiding officer uh, is uh, has the sole authority to call for order. Sergeant at arms will uh, will ensure uh, you know the uh, the etiquettes and uh, stuff, 
but uh, the call to order uh, is only done by the presiding officer. So, so is Ravi, uh, so is my understanding correct if I say that in a normal meeting where Toastmasters comes and presents speeches and evaluations are done, these are actually not, okay, these are not business meetings to take any decision. So the presiding officer could welcome everyone and continue with the meeting. But when it comes to a business session, for example, an election or a major decision with respect to the meeting venue or the meeting frequency or the meeting dates and things like that, then there is a, there should be a call to order to that particular segment and then we follow the procedure. Is that understanding correct? Correct, correct. That, that's exactly what... Okay, I okay. Want. Thank you. Thank you. And sorry for interrupting you now. No, no, please. It would be, because it would be better, we need, it would be we need better to questions. ask the question now. Yeah, okay. We need more questions because question will enhance your, everybody's knowledge, including mine, you know, if there is some uh, loophole there. So, um, by the way, Ravi, your video is off just for your information. Yeah, because I have some internet problems. So I just uh, uh, switched it off so that, you know, because the, the internet signal was showing weak. So, okay, so let us continue. Uh, so we have this agenda with us, which usually has uh, uh, the call to order. We have, uh, okay, so, once the call to order is done by the presiding officer, uh, there is a roll call. So roll call is uh, just to ensure that there is a quorum. Quorum means uh, the minimum uh, minimum active members during the meeting uh, that, uh, that can take a decision. So without quorum, uh, the, the meeting cannot continue, right? So the roll call is the most essential uh, part of the order of business. Then we have uh, the minutes, there is a sequence. It, it can vary from minute to, from meeting to meeting. The previous minutes of the meeting uh, are read. There is a treasurer's report that is usually presented. There are committee reports, uh, club growth committee, uh, the, 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 the quality uh, program quality committee. Uh, if there are some unfinished business uh, that, may, that may be tabulated, uh, some new business uh, can be discussed. And finally, you adjourn. Now we come to the one of the most important aspect of a parliamentary procedure, which is called a motion. So what is a motion? A motion is nothing but a structured way that brings an idea or a plan of action before the group or the committee. It is an orderly way to conduct business that is put on the floor and then that is debated, discussed, and finally, the action is taken by the group. So the member, the usual procedure is the me a member makes a motion. There is another member who seconds it. Uh, the presiding officer places the motion before the group. The motion is open for debate. And in some cases, uh, it go, and in some cases, a debate is curtailed. In some cases, the uh, second, uh, second member need not uh, the, 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 the amendment need not have a second uh, member's uh, uh, consent. So it's, it's, it's all, uh, there are different, uh, uh, different methodologies that I will uh, explain in the subsequent slides. But finally, the presiding officer takes a call and he votes for the motion. What are some of the most commonly used motion? So as you see on the screen, there are so many motions. Uh, in fact, these are few, there are few more actually. Uh, when I went into the Robert's rule book, there are so many other motions as well. These are few that is commonly uh, encountered in our Toastmasters meeting. So which one do you do first? So in uh, the parliamentary procedure, there are certain classes and order of motion that, has, that is followed. So there is a sequence, a precedence, which is as follows. So there are something called as privileged motions, subsidiary motions, incidental motions, and main motion. For the sake of uh, the flow of the precedence, let me first uh, discuss bottoms up. So 
I will first go to the main motion because what happens is uh, the subsidiary motion is dependent on the main motion. The incidental and privileged are special motion. So I will first explain on the main motion what it is, and then we can uh, get into the flow. So a main motion is put forward by a member who wants the group to do something. So for that, he must first rise and be recognized by the presiding officer. Especially in case of the district uh, council meetings and committee meetings, uh, usually you raise your hand first and then uh, you stand up so that everybody recognizes you. Then you uh, introduce yourself and then uh, the presiding officer recognizes you. Once you are recognized, the member says, I move the motion or I propose or whatever that motion may be. And the main motion, once it is put forward to the floor, it has to be seconded by uh, another member. Why this secondment, you know, when initially, uh, when this uh, second man, uh, second, uh, seconding the motion was put, I used to wonder what is the significance of this, you know? See, one person puts the motion on the floor. Is it not good enough to start discussion and, uh, you know, uh, uh, and then take it forward? So why you need a, a somebody who has to second the motion? So the reason is this, that what I could uh, make out was, if let's say uh, uh, an event or a, a motion is put forwarded by a person which is totally out of context, which doesn't match uh, with any of uh, the organization uh, alignment. <clears throat> so in such cases, if there is nobody to second, the motion itself dies down. So there should be at least one person who should be in consensus with this, just to prove a point to the presiding officer and the committee that this is worth discussing for. So th there has to be somebody who should second the motion. So once the main motion is put forward, the, the member has to second the motion in order to start the discussion on the subject. If the person who disagrees on the motion, let's say a member puts a motion that, okay, uh, next meeting, we want to have it in Crown Plaza Hotel, let's say, for example. And then he realizes this motion is not, uh, maybe late. This, is, this doesn't hold waters at this point in time, and he wants to pull it back. So he can withdraw that motion at that point in time without the consent of the seconder. But in this case, what happens, there is a slight embarrassment that happens for the second, uh, the person who seconded the motion, because then he has, he has seconded for nothing, right? So, but usually this is very, it very rarely it occurs. Usually the main motion, whoever proposes the main motion uh, is seconded and then he goes, uh, goes with it. I have never uh, come across but there is a situation, if such thing happens, then the second, uh, the second, the person who has seconded, uh, can, the, I mean, the, the first person, person can withdraw the motion without the consent of the second person. So the chair, once the motion is seconded, the chair will reinstate the motion and ask for the discussion. For example, Let's come back to the same venue, venue example. Let's say if somebody proposes a motion that the club meetings or the district council meeting has to be held in Crown Plaza Hotel. And there is one, somebody who has seconded it. So the chair will reinstate this motion and, uh, and ask for the discussion. So he will say it has been moved and seconded that the district council meeting, the next district council meeting has to happen at Crown Plaza Hotel. Is there a discussion? So he will put the motion to the floor for further discussion. So there are certain rules for the discussion, which is as follows. The presiding chair or the presiding officer cannot enter the debate. 
he is only facilitating and taking a final call but he doesn't have a say on uh, the motion whether for the motion or against the motion proposer of the motion has a first right of debate so the person who has proposed he will start the conversation first he can say let's say for example uh, this particular venue there is some parking problem so let's move it to the so i am proposing it to move to crown plaza because we have a valet parking we have ample uh, space in front of the hotel where we where we can park so he has the first right to place his points with regard to his motion proposed then there can be a debate with alternates between those for and those against but the debate has to be pertinent to the motion this is a, it it should not uh, deviate to some other area so the, the debate has to be pertinent to the uh, location of the meeting in this case sometimes what happens the the deviation the discussion goes on and on and on and on it prolongs for, for a long time so there is also a motion a uh, there is a facility by which you can set up a motion to stop or limit the debate that we will see in the upcoming slide one more uh, rule that was very interesting that crossed my mind was when we speak when the uh, proposer of the motion or whoever is speaking in the debate looks has to look to the to the presiding officer not to the presiding officer but to his chair you know this is what the robert uh, book of rules says he is not even supposed to look at the presiding officer so the chair so he speaks to the chair and all remarks to be addressed to him and there is no cross debate that is permitted so for example the the one person puts up puts a point till he finishes a point nobody can interject once he finishes his point then the other uh, party is given the chance to put forward his his remarks and also it is not permissible for example let's say i proposed to change the venue of the uh, meeting to crown plaza so i cannot contradict my own motion at a, at a later point in time so i have to stick to what i have proposed so the initial proposer is mandatory that he sticks to his own motion and but he can vote against his own, his own motion uh, i hope you are getting it so for example if i have uh, put forward that the next district council meeting should be held at crown plaza but when the presiding officer after the conclusion of the debate when the presiding officer asks for the votes of the ayes and the nays i can vote against my own proposition so that is allowed but speaking against the own motion is not allowed right there is a there is a fine line here and as usual uh, um no one is permitted to make any personal attacks or question the motives of other speakers so that is always the case uh, when the call of order has begun and whenever possible the presiding officer should let the floor alternate between those speaking in support and those speaking in opposition so one point each so that that gives a fairness uh, uh, to the debaters and for the point to be explained at large when a large number of people for example in a district council meeting if a large number of people who are ready to speak then you have to then the presiding officer usually takes a uh, takes makes a list of the names of people who want to speak and then he calls one by one so that you know all of them don't speak at the same time the members are not authorized to disrupt the assembly and the rules of the debate can be changed by a two thirds vote for example if let's say uh, the debate is prolonging on and on and it is going way beyond the time schedule so uh, the, the the rules of the debate so we can have a two thirds majority to curtail the uh, the debate length let's say 5 minutes not more than 10 minutes <clears throat> so that is always possible so when the debate concludes 
the chair says if there is no further debate the motion is then he repeats the motion the motion is to change the location of the next district council meeting to crown plaza hotel he will repeat the motion are you ready for the question which means he is making sure that they are ready to vote so he will say all those in favor he will again repeat the motion all those in favor of changing the location of the meeting to crown plaza hotel say i and those opposed say no so whoever is in support of the motion will uh, raise their hand or they say i and who are opposed they will say no or nay and finally the results of the vote is announced by the presiding officer he says either the motion is carried with one uh, hit of the gavel which means the decision is done so either he says the motion is carried which means the next meeting will be held at the crown plaza hotel or we say the motion is lost which means the the meeting continues for the next meeting also continues at the same venue so as explained earlier there is no multitasking allowed so before any another any other motion can be made a motion that is in the floor has to be either voted or withdrawn or amended so only one thing at a time so once the single motion is done then we move on to the next itinerary now we move on to the subsidiary motion so we we just were discussed briefly on the main motion so subsidiary motion is nothing but it is a subset of the main motion in the sense that it assists in treating and disposing of the main motion so all of the subsidiary motion requires a second so what are some of the subsidiary motions to lay on the table to call for a previous question to limit or extend debate to postpone to a definite time to refer to a committee to amend to postpone indefinitely to lay on the table is a very interesting uh a, para, a sentence which caught my attention so what it means is it means it will enable the assembly to immediately close the to make up let's say a motion is happening we want to park it temporarily because a uh, something urgent has come up so you park that motion temporarily aside this is called to lay on the table so such things uh, um, and to postpone a definite time let's say let's say we have a definite time meeting it starts at 7 and ends at 9 and if when you see the flow of the meeting is it may take time you can call for an extension to refer to a committee uh, let's say uh, you are talking on the uh, let's say division club realignment if there is a realignment subject that comes up and that is proposed as a motion by some member then this has to be referred to a realignment committee because those are the those are the specialized person who has who have looked into this so for certain decisions you have to refer to certain specialized committees uh, to amend of, that can be of anything you can amend uh, the the itinerary the agenda to postpone indefinitely to postpone the current meeting indefinitely that also can be done in the subsidiary motion the only rule of the game is when you are amending a motion it should be in complementary or it should be in germane to the main motion right uh, let's say for example uh, let's say we let's take the same example the shifting of the venue of the next meeting to xyz so if there is another member who wants to insert to this uh, motion let's say he says we will have every first meeting of the month at crown plaza but the second meeting let's have it in the same place so he slightly modified the motion the initial motion was let's move uh, to a new location for all the future meetings but the amendment is 
to have the first meeting in the new place and the second meeting at the existing location. So it 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 has added to the motion. Similarly, likewise, you can subtract uh, the item uh, subtract uh, the items from the motion as well. You can strike out. You can substitute the motion based on uh, the need or based on the members' uh, thinking. But uh, the motion uh, which is used to amend must be seconded. So only after it is seconded, it is taken uh, on the floor by the presiding officer. So let's say the motion is put on the floor and there is an amendment that is also uh, being put up. So before you go to the main motion, you have to first clarify and conclude the amendment. So only the once the amendment is debated and concluded, should you go to the initial motion because other it cannot otherwise it will be totally ambiguous because you are having two different motion at the same time. So you first handle the amendment, the presiding officer. He has to first handle the amendment. Once the amendment is done and fixated, that is the time when the motion goes to the floor, whether the amendment is uh, accepted or whether it is removed or modified, whatever the case may be. So once the amendment is seconded, the debate moves to a discussion on the amendment only. Is it good or not? Like in this case, the amendment was the first meeting at Crown Plaza, the second meeting is, uh, at the current location. Then the discussion starts, is it good or not? So finally, at the end of the debate, if the amendment fails, then the argument will continue on the same motion. What was the same initial motion? Initial motion was the location of the meeting should be at the Crown Plaza. And if the amendment passes, then the previous motion is superseded by the amended motion. Correct? I hope you are, you are all getting it because uh, I may use complex sentences sometimes. So, uh, so it is bottoms up approach. So, and there can be a second amendment also, you know, after this amendment, there can be amendment to an amendment. So it will be a bottoms up. So you first do the, uh, you clarify the second amendment, then you come back to the first amendment and then you come back to the main motion. So it is, it is worked backwards. And a maximum of only three amendments are allowed uh, as per the Robert rules of books, uh, a maximum of three. Uh, and I'm sure in, our, in Toastmasters also we are following that. Call for the previous question. This is a very interesting motion. As I told you, sometimes, you know, the debate goes on and on and on and you have no end to it. Someone, someone can say Crown Plaza parking is, uh, there is no valet. Uh, the ground is also full, so we cannot ensure the parking. So therefore this location is not good. Uh, the others may say the current location is good. We know the place, we know the setup. So it is uh, good for, uh, for our uh, club so that uh, we are accustomed to the facilities here. But in Crown Plaza, they can allot any different rooms at any different point in time. So the, the debates can take various shapes and it can go on and on. But when you see that the debate has no end, then in order to curtail it, we can force a vote on the motion. Of course, it must be recognized by the chair. Okay, so we were at, okay, call for the previous questions done. Okay. So um, we come to the third kind of uh, motion, which is called privilege motion. So privilege motion is actually, it does not relate to any pending business, but it is only related to some urgent matters, which without debate must be considered immediately. For example, uh, let's say a member thinks that there has been a mistake in the procedure. So this mistake should be corrected immediately before any further action is taken. For example, let's say the uh, district officer has forgot to take, a, he has forgotten to take the roll call and the quorum before he starts the meeting. So uh, in this situation, uh, any member can raise a point of order 
and he can uh, point out that please we need to take the quorum first uh, of course before that he has to recognize himself and the chair will give him a go ahead he may say that state your point and you make your point saying that uh, the quorum is not uh, being, uh, the roll call is not taken so therefore i urge you to take the roll call so this a uh, privilege uh, point of order uh, precedes any other normal activity that is going on during the uh, course of the meeting uh, there is one more type of motion uh, which is called incidental motion which is nothing but the questions of procedure that arise out of other motions so the previous one that we saw was Uh, the privilege motion which is nothing to do with the pending business but with the matters of procedure and for the incidental motion it seeks clarification or information that is that arises out of the current motion in this situation uh, you can interrupt another speaker and in this situation there is no second required and this is not debatable or amenable and responded to or by the chair for example let's say a district or a division realignment club realignment is tabled so you can the the person can ask for a incidental motion on requesting more information on what basis let's say a particular club is moved from one area to other and that area probably is weak or therefore the realignment team thought that this uh, team uh, adding to adding up to this area can be beneficial so you can ask for a information that on what basis was this club moved from area x to area y so this is a request for information and this uh, has to be answered by the presiding officer or he will direct it to the special committee or special Uh, committee members who can answer your question so this incidental uh, motion is a part of uh, the the motion that is ongoing and it is arising out of the debate of the current motion so to wrap up i'll just show the slide where we had discussed the four different types of motions which is privileged motions subsidiary motions incidental motion i mean main motion is the one uh, that is proposed Uh, to the house uh, the subsidiary motions are those where you amend it is it is a subset of the main motion where you can uh, do the amendments then you have the privileged motions just in case if uh, the procedures are not followed uh, that need, that can be highlighted and finally we have the incidental motions where uh, we seek for clarification or seek information with relate to to the main motion so all in all the parliamentary procedure is followed and uh, in our toastmaster fitter forum especially the business meetings and we see how orderly it is conducted uh, in the district meetings when i remember when we were district uh, 70 uh, district 72 uh, when we had all these eight nations the the district council meeting used to go like four five hours it it could it it, it was to prolong with debates after debates and quite an interesting uh, uh, it was quite interesting for me to be a part of it so at that point in time we never knew what was the kind of the different terminologies used but however it's always good that you have uh, these information uh, what are the types of motion and uh, what is the uh, what are the norms and uh, the procedures that we follow Uh, we uphold each other's respect uh, we agree to disagree uh, we uh, uh, and amicably uh, we settle things uh, in spite of uh, there being uh, some you know negative points to certain you know, clubs but still you take all that uh, in the in the spirit of the uh, procedure and uh, we once the decision is taken we all abide by the decision so so that's that's what this parliamentary procedure uh, puts in for us and uh, let's hope uh, we all be a part of it and uh, and uh, happy uh, what do you call it uh, participating in such parliamentary procedures
so for uh, just to uh, just to finish it off i would like to uh, can somebody uh, propose a motion and somebody second it let me see i i will uh, take up the role of the presiding officer so if somebody can uh, put forward a motion and somebody can second it shall i stop sharing my screen so after having talked so much on this can i have somebody who can put a motion and second it philip sir you want to propose acha sorry ravi sir mangai ma'am wants to propose the... please mangai ma'am propose one uh, one motion let's say you are in a I, district council i division g director chief master ramil mangai would like to propose a motion to extend the meeting by 30 minutes i nalini mathu tli chair of division g second the motion so having the motion of uh, extending the meeting by half an hour may i now put it to the floor for the motion to extend the meeting by half an hour people who agree with the motion say i i and people who disagree with the motion say nay nay no no she she meant nay like saying i <laughs> so uh, having the more number of eyes the motion is carried i hope is there any any doubts that anybody have uh, uh, ravi yeah. uh, just a, just a uh, question see the motion that uh, division director raised uh, in a, in a normal meeting could have been raised as a privilege motion uh because maybe we were discussing on a main motion mm. and since the order of the meeting said this meeting is for 2 hours uh you you mentioned about a privilege uh, motion it's not the, not the information the other one what was it Inc- incidental. incidental incidental so actually when a main motion is in place and you find that the time is for the meeting is going to get over for the time to get extended uh either somebody could say no we cannot extend it or uh what do you think because i have seen this in the district meeting yeah because see usually when we start the debate uh, the presiding officer doesn't set up a time he just uh, uh, seconds puts it on the floor but when he sees the debate is going on and on that is the time when somebody has to bring in the privilege motion so uh, the usual pattern is unless if he is so prudent and if he knows that this is going to take lot of time unless he three determines the time that this particular motion will have only 5 minutes of discussion if that is putting on the floor then there is no need of privilege motion by default a 5 minutes the debate concludes and the presiding officer goes for the voting uh, in, in if there is not such a scenario then somebody has to call for the privilege motion which is usually the case because i have never seen a, a district director you know uh, predetermined uh, the, the timing and then starting the motion so but and i have not seen also a privileged motion that is coming to extend or curtail the debate no that i have come know. across in the district yes uh, i have come across that in the district two things i have come across one is to amend the agenda second is to extend the time uh, extend the time yeah and there is one more very common uh, motion that puts is do not read the last minutes of meeting <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Because this is no, no, this is something you know. I wanted to confirm still. Like you know, where do we have this secret ballot, and where do we have this public ballot? Sometimes you know, in certain issues, it becomes a little uh, challenging for the members to raise their hands and in, uh, in open rights. Is there any criteria defined by in the rules that these are the occasions the presiding officer should go for uh, secret ballot and uh, the occasions where it it can be public? no uh, the presiding officer when you say the eyes and the nays so oh, i got your point very well because somebody can raise the hands for both is that what you are saying so yeah. that can the not only officer, that see yeah. i may not be you know comfortable in sharing my opinion in front of uh, philip sir okay so that mm-hmm. way hmm. no uh, see 
exactly so in in such a let's say if i am the presiding officer and if i have 400 members in the meeting it will be very difficult for me to and if the eyes and the nays are somewhat nearby it's very difficult to uh, to assess whether it is a yes or a no in such situation you can call for a uh, call for a ballot you can yeah, call really, for a I, ballot like you mentioned when we were district 79 uh, sometimes uh, like uh, alar mail said people say hi and nay for both So yes. especially in an election, since it has to be accurate, we go for the ballot. Exactly. Otherwise, if we go for the ballot every time, the meeting will never get over. So the raising the hand or the high and the nay is good. But if you are not able, like uh, Ravi mentioned, if you are not able to judge that correctly, then you go for the ballot. And most of the times, uh, electing the officer goes on the ballot. yeah electing the officers uh, is the election procedure so the uh, of course that has to have a ballot uh, but that will not go with the eyes and the nays oh okay, uh, okay yeah election is a that's a different aspect of course it's a part of the part of the meeting district council meeting but uh, but this is this is for the uh, the committees the alignment committee the treasury committee the uh, you know quality uh, the club growth committee all those committee reports and uh, any member to put forward any motion uh, for any subject for that matter is is what uh, we are discussing here for the elections yes that's a separate uh, uh, separate procedure uh, similar to this but on, except for the fact that it is a, it has a ballot right so that is how it is so uh, even the uh, as nalini mentioned even uh, the the elections in the club election the election officer holds the club excom now this is a time and in the june season you will have all the clubs conducting the club excom elections so make sure that the elections also follow the same parliamentary procedure so we have uh, we call upon the nominations from the floor three times if there is somebody who is willing to come up you have a you have a ballot you have a elections sort of a thing or else uh, unanimously elected so you follow all the protocols uh, that is imbibed just don't take it for granted so uh, so we have uh, we have followed you know just to make sure that uh, things are in a proper order i think uh, is that good enough is there any more questions we need one story yes ritu ma'am did you get any questions i should say q and a coordinator No, story. no, Mangai ma'am, I didn't get any question. No, the story is like you know the the good story that I heard yesterday was you know everybody will even the even in the district meeting everybody will push each other. You talk, you talk, you put the motion, you put the motion. So nobody wants to bail the cat, you know. So uh, a story to this effect that I heard yesterday was you know uh, in a small town uh, there was this uh, you know the primitive circus doers. Well, they will have to one raw one rope, and then somebody will walk on the rope. So this gentleman is walking on the rope, and he has a small girl child, you know, on on his shoulder, and he is walking on the rope, and people are applauding, that uh, you know, fantastic, and all praises for him and all that. So uh, he did that stunt in such a good manner that you know, so the people said, please, please, once more, please do it once more for us. So he did it once more, and then said, no, no, once more. We we are so impressed by the stunt. so then what he did he what took off his daughter he said can please any one of you give your child child so you know i can do this <laughs> so so everybody you know the clapping went the appraisal went everything it's a grim grim looks on their faces so so the point is you know every everybody wants to do something but they want others to step in you know nobody wants to bail the cat so that should not be the case so if you feel something is happening in the district in the division which you want to raise your voice please do that is exactly why the parliamentary procedures are in place uh, however silly it may sound to some it doesn't matter uh, put your motion get a somebody will second it of course and then and let's have a healthy debate let's fight it out <laughs>